Hey, I'm Sean Tice with Let's Talk About Fatherlessness. Excited to have our guest today. She's a friend of mine, Dr. Michelle Watson Canfield. So excited to have you today. I'm so glad to be here. As we know, we're grafted in family. I call you my little brother. So here we are. Yes, we, I met Michelle um, I, probably, what, at least five years ago, something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. Uh, we were at an event together, and my wife and I just instantly connected with her and just so thankful we, to have her in our lives. We adopted each other right away. <laughs> exactly. She's my big sister. I'm her, yeah. I'm her uh, little brother, and it's just, yeah. uh, just, just amazing. And so we've, we've connected different events, you know, things like that, and you just have a, a specialty in the area of fatherhood, and so I just want you to share... Why don't you go ahead and share some about your your ministry, and then we'll get into maybe even some of your story and things like that. Sure. Well, I mean, just for starters, there may be some of your listeners going, wait, fatherlessness? Like, okay, maybe fathers talking to fathers about fathering. Maybe unusual, you might be thinking to have a woman talking to fathers about fatherlessness or fathering. And I agree. But let me give you the backstory. So in December of 09, I was reading in Luke 1 about how Zechariah was told that his yet-to-be-born son, John, John the Baptist, would help turn the hearts, not the heads, of fathers to their children. And I just heard God whisper, that's what I want you to do, Michelle. And I was like, what? And two days later, blow drying my hair, just heard the name The Abba Project. Abba meaning daddy in Aramaic, Mm -hmm. and then love a project. And so January of 10, I wrote emails to 11 dads whose daughters at the time were my counseling clients. So I've been a clinician now in private practice, mental health for 27 years. So at that point, I invited these dads whose daughters in their teens and 20s were my clients. And 10 of the 11 dads said, sure, we're in, we'll come. And I had people say, men do not add more to an already full plate unless there's a need. And so we ended up going a year. I had no curriculum. Every month, God gave me what to really present to these men. It's still the curriculum I use today. It became really the foundation for my first book, Dad, Here's What I Really Need From You, a guide for connecting with your daughter's heart. So since then, I now do, you know, speaking at men's conferences. I do blogs every other week, Dad Daughter Friday blogs. I started in radio in 16, the Dad Whisper, which is now just a podcast, the Dad Whisper podcast. So Again, I might be getting ahead of you, but if any dads of daughters want more resources, you can go to my website, drmichellewatson.com, and I have lots for you there because I'm all about equipping dads to invest in their daughter's heart, not their just their heads, but their heart space. And sometimes at the end of the day, because men are from Mars, women are from Venus, meaning I speak Venusian, you speak Martian, two different languages, I'm wanting to help dads decode their daughters so that they can really dial in with more precision at a heart level. Yeah. That, and it's wonderful. I, I, I love what you do. I mean, obviously we're friends, but I follow uh, what you do with your social media posts and the things you're putting out there. And I think it's so effective. And even as a, a guy that grew up without a dad, um, the resources you're producing helps, you know, helps me, you know, the things you put out on social media helps me see that I need to be, you know, make sure I'm focused on my daughter. And, you know, I just, I love how you share that. Now you have a great relationship with your dad. I mean, a lot of this was probably birthed out of that, right? You know, a lot of it was, and some of it wasn't. So I would say my dad and I, through the years, I'm in my sixties now, my dad's in his eighties, we've been close. And yet I could tell you, I wrote about this in my first book about a study that was done around the same time between two dad's organizations. One asked dads, how close do you feel to your daughter? About 75 said we're close. Really interesting that almost at the same time, another organization asked daughters, how close do you feel to your dad where you can talk to him about sex and some of the harder things? And 75% of them said, I can't talk to my dad about any of that stuff. So it's not right, wrong. It's that we have different perceptions oftentimes of what close really looks like. And if you're a dad listening, I would encourage you to ask your daughter on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the most, zero being neutral or nothing, what number would you say? matches for how close you feel we are and follow it up then with would you like that number to be any different and what could I do to be a better dad to be closer to you so really when I think about my dad and I we've been close on a lot of levels but a few years ago uh, he and I would do these Monday dates where we go buy groceries so we go to Costco and have you know really expensive dinner and then do groceries and 
I remember asking my dad, I'm like, do you think we're very close? And this is only maybe seven, eight years ago. And he said, not as close as you'd like us to be. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? And I said, you're right. And you know why, Sean? It's because I, I, I've I, plumbed the depths, so to speak, of me. Like I have yeah. deep, I have deep emotion. I have a deep trauma history. I've gone to all those places, invited Jesus into them. And my dad isn't as comfortable with those spaces. And so sometimes for me, it feels like there's a lot of the depth of me that my dad has missed. So has my dad showed up in a lot of ways? Absolutely. And he grew up on the south side of Chicago, fatherless. His dad died of gangrene, homeless, lived in a boxcar. Wow. He had worked for the railroad. And the, you know, the effects of alcohol devastated his life. And he was very sick when he died. And I mean, I never met him. And so the last time my dad's dad ever was in their home, it was when he, my dad's mom put an iron to her drunk husband's face. And so he never came back. So my dad grew up basically fatherless. And had no idea how to be a dad. So when you think about how far my dad's come, oh my goodness, leaps and bounds. Here he is with four daughters. And yeah. here I am, very emotionally, I would say, wired, adept. You know, <laughs> thankfully, I have a profession where I get to go to all those places with clients who want to go there, invite me to go there. But really, at the end of the day, I would love my dad to know more of the depths of me. And that's why even with my second book, Let's Talk, Conversation Starters for Dads and Daughters, I wrote that out of a desire to say, Dad, I don't want you to have any excuse for not going deeper in knowing your daughter. Because we figure things out by talking. So when you open up a, a conversation that's on 60 different themes, let her pick them, it lets you then have the script right there so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If your daughter says that the questions are stupid, blame me. I'm your fall guy. Roll me under the bus. And uh, I want to set you up to succeed, dad, so that you have no excuse. Because you and I, Sean, you've been on my show a couple, what, two, three times. Yeah. And you and I have talked about the fact that fatherlessness as an epidemic can also take the shape of a dad who's there in his home physically, but not emotionally, not spiritually. And that there can be father absence, even with a dad who's home, but he kind of doesn't have anything left. And so really, I would say that's the heart of why I wrote the books that I have, because I believe we will have a healthier country from the ground up with healthier women. And you can tell when they have a connection to their dad, they shine. That's so true. And, and I think the ones that don't have dads are craving that, you know what I mean? Um now with your dad, did he, is there ever a time where he purposed and I want to just, I want to break the cycle and be a good dad. Or was it just, he just wanted to follow what God had for him or was there ever a decision there where he was like, I want to do better than my dad did. Or, did you know, I think that? some of it, that's a good question. I think some of it was more intuitive or okay. we could say spirit led, but at the same time, I know that my dad would seek out other men who yeah were further along the fathering journey than him. And he would go to, you know, like men's conferences and they would have a breakout on fathering. And he's going, I don't even know what to do. So I remember one time when I was probably beginning high school and we had moved from California to Oregon for my dad to go to seminary, become a pastor, which was actually a few years earlier. But I remember my dad said, hey guys, we're getting up 15 minutes earlier. We're having devotions every morning, family devotions. And he obviously had never had that happen. But some men said, this is what you need to do with your kids. So my dad came home and did what they said. And then he's like, well, what do we do? And they're like, you can read Bible story books. Tuesdays were missionary day. We read missionary prayer letters. We had prayer cards. We'd all pass them out, pray for the missionary on our card. We would act out Bible stories. Um, we would have a worship time or we would play music. But it was one of those things where my dad kind of learned on the job from other dads that said, do this. Wow. That's that's wonderful. I mean, that's I, I had when you're saying that I, I, the same way, I was just at a, an event in January. Tony Evans was speaking at it and we took some of the things that he said and brought them home with us. And it's changed our nights, um, the way we do some of our night routines with our kids, with our suppers and things like well, that. So 
Tell me what um, you've done. Well, we for years we would just like eat supper in the living room, and I, you know, and stuff like that. Like we were just kind of like that was our downtime for the day. And yeah. Chill. Um, but he's like, be at the table, and so what mm. we started doing on Tuesdays and Thursday nights is we we eat eat at the table, and we have that that time. But then also we play a game after, and so mm. the kids just I love it. Um, we've been doing that for a few months now, and it's really changed. Mm. Because to be honest with you, we you know I lived the youth pastor life before that, so we were constantly running. I lived the uh, we traveled on the road for three years, and so the only place we could eat was in the living room. And so, you know, mm-hmm. we're like, okay, let's restructure this and change things up. And and that's really, really just for the last few months, it's really been really cool to see. I mean, I was already connected to my kids. Don't get me wrong, but it's even, it's made a deeper connection. Um, More intentional. Yeah. And so even like, even the other thing is I started working out with my, my sons, my wife work, works out with my little daughter and we spend time doing that even before supper. So we're actually spending even more bonding time together. And so it's just a lot of those little changes that I, I've learned, you know, like I learned from Tony Evans speaking at it. So if you're a dad that didn't have a dad, learn from other dads. That's what I've been doing. And, and in fact, I'm let not, me even, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, I'll even tell you another story is my dad then went to this men's conference. This is in Oregon. When, again, I, I think I may have been early, late junior high, early high school. And they said, you know, they're talking about being better dads. And my dad said he had this thought of what are girls like? Okay, if I'm supposed to be a better dad, he was like, they like perfume. Yeah. So he literally came home and said, I'm going to start this tradition. And we did this all the way up till I got married three years ago. No, I don't have this from my dad anymore. Boo-hoo. But my dad started perfume day. Once a year, Christmas, he said, I'm only taking my unmarried daughters. So there was a while there where I was it. I was the only one left, even though I was the oldest of four girls. But we would go to Nordstrom's or Macy's. I've had dad say, I took my daughter to Rite Aid. It doesn't matter where. But what was so fun, Sean, and you know all about this, but perfume day started and I would look forward to it all year. My dad would come with me, sit, Mm. imagine the perfume section of you know Nordstrom, you don't have a lot of men just hanging out there. So my dad would sit on a chair, they'd get him one, and I'd have to try the perfume all up and down my arms. My dad would smell them and together we would decide. And That's he never good. looked at the price tag. And imagine this. In fact, I just read at Easter here recently about Mary who knelt at Jesus' feet and broke mm-hmm. that alabaster jar and anointed his feet with this oil, this expensive perfume that permeated the room. And I think of how perfume day for me is very in line with this of, I had a scent all year that when I wear it, it reminds me of my connection to my dad and where your treasure is there, your heart is. And I'm all about talking to dad about what does it mean to turn your heart? What, not your head, your heart, which means more emotive, intuitive, softer, gentler, kinder, maybe even slower, more interactive. And oftentimes that's where dads say, that is not my favorite skill set. And I'm like, your daughter's going to help bring it out in you. And so at a heart level, when I think about just perfume day and what that's meant, that might be a practical thing for a dad listening and have a rhythm and a routine. And Sean just talked about that Tony Evans said, establish this rhythm and this routine with your child because it establishes a foundation that gets internalized in the core of who they are, that they will carry forward. And we're giving you lots of ways that you can do that today, because I love practical action steps. So dads can be heroes, which means you have to take action. I love that. And I'm definitely, I'm going to do some type of, I've seen you post about that on social media, and I'm going to do some type of, uh, you know, thing like that with my daughter, perfume or something. But I think that's such a cool thing. Um, And you're right. It could be something else. I've had dads do books go all around a bookstore or kind of painting, maybe make that where you go to one of those painting things, you know, right. Or pottery or, you know, anything like that. That's wonderful. Um, Now shifting gears over to fatherlessness. I want to, want to talk to you about girls that don't have a dad and, you know, the statistics say that 71% of pregnant teenage girls come from fatherless homes. There's another one out there that says a white teenage girl from an advantaged background is five times more likely to become a teen mother if she grows up in a single mother household than if she grows up with both biological parents. You know, that those are just a couple of the studies. 71% yeah. of pregnant teenage girls come from fatherless homes. Now, we when I, I go and preach, I talk about this. 
And we share that girls, they, they lack security. Dads provide security to their lives. And when they don't have that security, they look for it in another place, another man. Would you speak more on that and also anything else that uh, girls are lacking when they don't have a dad? Well, what girls lack, again, this is research-based. Yeah. I'm going to actually say it in a positive way of say what girls do receive okay. when they yeah. are connected. So yeah. you guys who are listening can say, oh, then this is what I don't have. And girls, daughters who feel connected to their dads, they're more likely to finish high school and attend college, get better grades, less body dissatisfaction and healthier weight, less depression lower rates of suicide. This one dads are going to love. They delay their sexual debut, yeah. which means lower rates of teen pregnancy, as you just highlighted. And one of my favorites too, is that she will also have more pro social empathy. And we know less jail time by 80% all because of dad. In other words, dad, you're the antidote to pregnancy, teen pregnancies, um, delinquency, to lower rates of, of, you know, suicide, to lower grades, and on it goes. So daughters that don't have a dad have all of that. But now I want to flip this and say, research, it's me search. Because at the end of the day, oh man, this, this moves me actually into tears, is my God statistics don't add up. The God I know that you know that we love, who's my heavenly father, says, I don't go by statistics. To me, a day is a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. Or watch me provide out of nothing. Like his numbers don't line up with earthly numbers. So the truth is, even if you have the best dad in the world, or if you have no dad, you still need a heavenly father who provides, protects, stabilizes, covers you under his wing. And that's where healing comes, is that there really is no such thing as fatherlessness. There is fatherfulness, as my husband Ken often talks about. When we know whose we are, who and defines who we are. And so at the end of the day, I think about how much, even in my own life, connecting with God as a father has added what I would call like a three-pronged stool. I was always connected to Jesus. Then years ago, I started going to a Pentecostal church, Foursquare. I'm like, oh, who's Holy Spirit? Who knew? Nobody really talked about Holy Spirit in my conservative Baptist church or in Bible college. But later on in my journey, I begin to really dial into the fact that I have a father mm. who, according to Luke 15, 20, does five things. Jesus said, it's all red letter. Prodigal son, I want you to know my dad. He stands and he sees you. He runs toward you. He's filled with compassion, embraces you and kisses you. Jesus is saying, that's the dad that I want you to know. And so if you're listening today and you fall into that category of going, I got the short end of the stick because my dad's nowhere to be found, which I know, Sean, is a bit of your story. And God is your dad. That's where you found healing. So we both, this is why we're kindred spirits. We, we speak a similar language. And I'll just tell one quick story is I have, I call her my honorary adopted daughter. So Taylor lost her mom when she was in eighth grade. No siblings. Her dad died when she was a senior in high school. No grandparents, siblings, parents. So we adopted each other. I got to be mother of the bride three and a half years ago in her wedding. And I mean, we're grafted in family. And so here was Taylor when I met her. Very much a waif, like lost at sea, which is right, pretty indicative of those that don't have really parents at all, but especially her dad uh, in her life and her healing, Sean, she is radiant now. She knows who her Abba is, who has defined her, grounded her, healed her, restored her, because she knows that that dad is not just a dad sitting on a throne in heaven. This is a dad who is intersecting with her life. And when you meet someone that maybe knows the void of of a father wound or the lack of a dad's presence, how much deeper their gratitude and bond with God as a father, because a trauma bond is the deepest bond, the strongest bond two people can ever experience. Did you know that? Like people that were 
in a stairwell in 9-11 will be forever friends, right? Because they wow. bonded during trauma. And when you think about someone that has trauma due to father loss, father absence, father voids, father wounds, when God as a father comes in and says, I am your present right now, help in trouble. You are yoked to me. Yeah. I even love Jude one that says, you know, now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before God's glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Jesus presents you to his father saying, there's no fault here. He has joy when you're presented to him. And on I could go with scriptures from Psalm 103, right, about compassion or Deuteronomy, where it's saying, the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. And I think about getting shoulder rides from God as a father, like so many verses that tie to restorative relational healing that comes from God as a father. You can tell, and Sean, you're one of them. You can tell when someone has bonded, trauma bonded with God as a father, and it shows on their face and it shows in their life. So no one is ever too lost or there's too much absence ever to have healing. That's wonderful. Yeah. It's so, so good to, I, I, I can't express how how important it is to claim God as your father and and you know, during those times. Now, now, what about a dad that you know you work with a lot of dads? What about a dad that grew up fatherless? How do you help them if they've never experienced that yet? I mean, what where do you start? Because you know, some people they look at it as it's kind of weird to say God's my dad or God's my father. You know what I mean? Where do you start? Like where's the starting point for you when you, you work with somebody? Well, first of all, you have to start by saying, I have a need and I want to learn. So Jesus even said, let him who has ears, let him hear. Jesus was preaching, talking, inviting, but if someone was closed, right? So starting, they got nothing. So the starting point is you have to be a dad who's willing to learn what you don't know. Just like when you you know, take a class or you go to college or you you say, I want to learn that subject. So I'm going to pay money, use my time and my energy to learn that subject. So I think, first of all, if you grew up fatherless, you got to start by saying, I need to learn what I don't know. And sometimes if this fits, if the shoe fits, dad, wear it. But if, if there's pride there, saying, I don't want to admit that I don't know things. I don't want anybody to see that I don't know. It's really the opposite. Humble yourself and God will insult you. And so when you come willing to learn, that's first and foremost. Secondly, then it's to begin learning from someone you respect that what they say resonates with you. And I know that both Sean and I have materials. We have resources for you. And so like even this week, Sean, I write about this in my books, but I'm saying to dads, I'm starting to do these videos that are shorter, two to three minutes to just say, here's one thing one tool for your father in the toolbox. But like I will say, dad, put the two words I'm wondering in front of a question and your daughter will hear it as a legitimate question you're asking where you want you know, to hear from her versus you're just pounding her and interrogating her and demanding information. I'm wondering will change your tone and she'll hear you differently and it will make all the difference in how she responds. So giving you practical ways to dial in where you're learning something you've never heard before or maybe never experienced before. How would you know what you don't know? But there are resources out there to say, if you come ready to learn, Sean and I will help you. We will teach you things that we know that we've seen make big differences, right? Sean, not just minor, major big differences in in dads. And I, I honestly love nothing more than seeing dads build competence and confidence. But all of them started scared. And in fact, you know, I just pulled these out for our interview. So when I wrote this book, the first one to just explain how daughters are wired, you know, that dad, here's what I really need from you, you know, that there's eight dad daughter questionnaires in the back on different topics. And at the end of the day, dad, you're building a bridge to God as a father, whether you like that or not. I mean, those are big shoes to fill, makes you dependent on God, right? As a father. But like, I have a questionnaire on that and on body image. I want dads to talk about sex, to talk about sexual harassment, to talk about how to be a world changer, about depression, anxiety, suicide. So born out of my work with dads, one of them said, Michelle, now that the Ava project's over nine months, you gave us all the questionnaires. Now, what do we do? 
I think it's too big on our own. And I, that one dad, Reed, he, I literally said to him, you're not going to believe it. This past weekend, God gave me the second download of what to write on. And this is the book that came out a couple of years ago. Let's talk conversation starters for dads and daughters. So there's no excuse. All the questions are right here on topics where you get to read them. So dad, I love equipping you to step up. So you're building competence, just like you do at the gym. You're going to lift heavier weights, more reps. You got to show up at the gym if you want to get stronger. And then doesn't that build your confidence? So it's the same thing relationally as it is physically. And that's the one of the biggest joys of my life, greatest joys of my life, is to see dad step up, up step in, and then the dividends speak for themselves where kids are shining because they know dad loves them. And I love even sometimes where dads will like be shaking, going, this is kind of embarrassing. I'm taking her out on a date and I'm going to read a script. And I'm like, I've never heard a daughter say she thinks it's lame. Mm -hmm. I've heard the exact opposite. Like, it's so cute. Like my dad has the book and he's writing down what I say. I love it. I'm like, okay, there you go. <laughs> That's great. Now, what now? Okay. You spoke to the dad. What about a young lady, you know, maybe a teenager, a young adult that is doesn't have a dad? You know, you already spoke on this a little bit, claiming God is your heavenly father. Where do you start, though? If somebody's working with them, like we have a lot of, this is directed at a lot of pastors, ministry leaders. Where should mm -hmm. they start in trying to help that girl they're working with? Oh, my goodness. That is a packed question. Because, again, you know, the work I do clinically, getting in the yeah. trenches with people's pain. Mm -hmm. is such an honor that's holy ground to yeah me. oh yeah yeah I, but i'm saying if they're, if they're mentoring if they're like if they have a girl that they're mentoring maybe it's a niece or something and they're just sitting down having a conversation no, that, where do they start i mean where so that's you know, why i'm saying so you start by knowing this is holy ground to be invited into someone's story into their pain and and again i'm a pastor's daughter i'm a bible college grad and i used to be in the group of people that would say, but the joy of the Lord is our strength. And let's go over here to happy place. Yeah. You know, we can pray. That is not the best place to start. Okay. The place yeah. to start is aligning with their pain and saying, I want to hear your story. Mm -hmm. And the research shows men do better with shoulder to shoulder orientation. You know, side by side, we're working. And women, we, we tend, granted, this is a generalization, but to do better with face to face orientation. And so we often say, I can't tell you're listening unless I can see your eyes. And men are like, I don't want to see your eyes. That's too shoulder. So if you have a young lady, be conscious of the fact that if you're listening to her story and asking her questions, she's going to tell if you're tired of listening or if you've maxed out. So you're going to have to dig deep and ask Jesus to help you look at her in the face. You don't have to stare. I mean, you can look away, but let her know that what she's saying and trusting you with has value because she's worth your time, which right there, we heal within the context of relationship to counter being hurt within the context of relationship. So the way that you as a man interact with her dad wound is so powerful because your presence is a gift. So dad, you've got to start by giving her your attention. Let her see your eyes. Let her see your face. Nod. Number two, ears, one mouth. Listen twice as much as you talk at her. You want to ask questions that draw her out. Again, I've got questions on this in my book on father wounds, on father voids that could help you. You could write some questions down and on your phone, bring them with you. But that's a key thing. And keep asking her questions about her story. Because so often I have found in groups that I've been in is people don't want to sit very long with the story. They just want to move to resolve. And now we're, we're happier now, right? Yeah. You want to follow her lead. She's not done she'll, till she's done. It may take way longer for her to get out the pain. But if we if think of it with a cup, if it's all the way full and you've got really good ice cubes to put in to make it better, but it's already up there, it's going to go over the top. So if, if she's already full of so much pain and you think, okay, let's praise Jesus, you got to find a way down here to, to drain the bottom of that cup so that there's room there to take in good and take in truth. But sometimes that can't happen until there's been a safe witness to the pain and to the story. And so that's sometimes where I've seen men, even pastoral leaders, maybe 
be less than successful. I'll use that for lack of another word in really pacing with a survivor, someone in pain, because they want to speed up the process. And if you want me to give another practical example or a really tool that you could use men and women, there's actually an art form to asking good questions. And again, this is something God's given me that I've loved teaching because you and I both know when we're on the front lines of teaching people things, it's like, how do I make this make more sense in a practical way and God downloads stuff, right? Yeah. So do you remember in school how we learned who, what, when, where, why, how? Remember those? Oh, yeah. So he already knows that. That's already a grid. So when you're listening, you use that grid. And I always say, why is the question you want to use the least? Because it often tends to lead to looping. Why did you do? I don't know. It doesn't lead. You, you could say, what were you thinking when you did that? See, it leads to a different answer. So don't use why as much. You want to do who, what, when, where, how. And then use the keyword or the last word of the sentence that you just heard and link it up. So she might cry and you're like, oh, I don't do good with emotion. Oh my gosh, here we go. <laughs> so you got to do your own work. This is an honor to be trusted with her tears. Mary cried at Jesus' feet. He didn't tell her to stop. You know, okay, God, grow my skill set. Right? We call that growing your window of tolerance to sit with that distress. And you'll grow if you're willing to do it. So then you sit there and think, and she's like, I can't like say that she said, I'll just, I'll always have a wreck life because my dad left me. And you're like, oh, what do I ask now? Deer in headlights. Oh, uh, what's a good question? Um, <laughs> Schultz had asked questions. What do I, no, no, no. I'm going to make this easier for you. You don't have to come up with a new question. You use her keyword or the last word. So Sean, I'm going to put you on the spot. What was a keyword or the last word of that sentence that she would have said? I don't know. Like, I'm just always going to have a wreck life. My dad left me. Left. He left. He left. It could be wrecked. Yeah. It could be, there's no right or wrong. There's the yeah. beauty, guys. But you're listening to something she said. So by using the who, what, when, where, how, it lets her know you heard her because she's yeah. going to be like a flower and open up. So you could say, what was that like when your dad left? How, how do you feel when you say you're wrecked? Mm. Where do you first remember feeling wrecked? Because your dad left, put them together. Like, you see what I'm saying? And then she will say a response that also doubles. You get double the, the points because she'll say, you heard me and you want to know more. And then that's how you sit with someone in their intensity and in their pain in a practical way. Does that make sense? So then she yeah. might say, um, yeah, how did you feel when your dad left? I don't know how to say it. It was just like this huge hole. And then you might say, what, what does the hole look like? What does it feel like to have a hole? How is that taking shape in your life to have that hole? I always feel behind everybody else. Everybody else is filled up. and I just got one big hole. And you're like, okay, I got lost in there. But the last word was hole. I'm going to do hole again. I just asked her about the whole, I'm going to ask it again because that last word stuck with me. So there's really no way that you can do it wrong. You listen and you do who, what, when, where, how. So what do you think, Sean? Yeah. Is that a practical way? Do you think yeah, that those yeah. could activate presence? Yeah, if, just be listening. Yeah, I agree. And then also we even we even teach if you ask for a prayer request or something, or if, you, if, they, if they say, hey, I'm dealing with this, and you say you're going to pray for it, follow up you know, a week later and say, Hey, how did that go? I was praying for you. So just not, not so you're just saying, Hey, I'll pray for you. Right. And you just walk away. Right. Actually and also, yeah. listening and hearing them and, and caring. Yeah. I love that. That you're saying I follow up. You could even say, can I write that down right now in my phone so that I make sure I have it right? Like those things that, you know, if we say God, right. Isaiah says he writes our name on the palm of his hand is that you're kind of in a way in the palm of your hand, you've got a phone you're letting that that fatherless son or daughter know they have value. And if you're even a mother listening, maybe that was your next question, Sean, is what do you do if you're a, a, a mother who's covering the bases of her yeah. dad, okay. who's absent? And I've had many women reach out and go, this is crazy because I can't find any men, I'm sure you hear that a lot, to fill the spot. My, the uncles aren't stepping in, yeah. the co-workers or anybody at church, or I don't know who's safe. Maybe a woman that's yeah. been violated. 
says, I don't know who to trust with my kids. Mm-hmm. And so the more you can lead your kids to drink from the word of God, put verses up around your house that talk about God as a father, your children will know then they are not, they're small F fatherless, but they're not capital F fatherless ever. And so it might be in the meantime, it might be until there is a dad figure or someone to step in. But every day you get to build the core foundation in their life of with truth that sets them free by letting them know whose they are. Yeah, that, that's so, so, so wonderful. Now we only have about two minutes left. Now I'm going to ask you a loaded question. I'm asking you a question that's a, you've got about a minute to respond to this. Okay? I love it. Um, and then for the last minute, we're going to wrap up and have, have you tell where you can you know, find you. But for the next minute, I want you to speak to the dad that's been absent. He's been gone. How does he start a relationship with his daughter? Just one minute. You have one minute with him. What do you, what do you do? Okay. You have to humble yourself and ask how you've hurt her or him, your child. You have to listen back and let them in any way they feel safe. It might be text. It might be a letter. It might be email. It might be a phone call. It might be FaceTime. But you have to let them set the pace because you hurt them. So they get to decide how to re-engage with you. And you have to ask, tell me how I hurt you when. Mm. And then invite them to tell you their story with no disclaimer, no rebuttal, only using the skill I just told you to say, tell me more. And so that when you say, will you forgive? I'm sorry for that. Will you forgive me for that? You know what it is that you're asking forgiveness for. That is so good. That was <laughs> amazing nuggets of truth. There's so many dads that need to do that, um, that have walked away. I wish my dad would have done that. So, I'm, I'm, But he did reach out a little bit before he, he passed away. Now, we only have about 45 seconds. Tell us where we can find you, um, where they can connect you more. So you can go to my website, drmichellewatson.com, and lots of free resources and links there. You can also listen to the Dad Whisper podcast on Apple and Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. And I do a Dad Daughter Friday blog. You can sign up for that. It's every other week. Find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, the Dad Whisper podcast there, Dr. Michelle Watson, Facebook. And I look forward to connecting with you. Also coach dads and daughters through Zoom across the country. So if you're in a hard place, invite me to be a part of the process with you because I believe healing can happen and it's never too late. To learn more about how you can get involved in fatherless family ministry, visit lifefactors.org where you can find some free resources. You can find our books that we have. You can find some, even the program that we have to help you start a single mom ministry within your ministry or within your church. We can all work together to lead fatherless families to the Heavenly Father.